uh, having for inviting me just to uh, uh, present uh, uh, in this uh, program and to uh, let the uh, rest of the community uh, at Texas A&M and our friends uh, beyond uh, learn about what we're doing here at, uh, at the uh, School of Law. Um, this is a very diverse uh, law school. Um, and I have to say it, it's, it's probably more diverse than many other uh, law schools. And when you look especially at our natural resources program with all the different fa uh, faculty involved and all the different topics involved, uh, there's a lot going on. And so what I wanna do is to give you a, 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 a little bit of a snapshot of all the different activities that are taking place at the law school, some of the research activities in particular, uh, and the professors, where we're doing it, especially interdisciplinary work, uh, interdisciplinary research, um, and where maybe there might be opportunities for, for um, you know, colleagues from other departments, other units uh, at the university to uh, look to the law school uh, for collaborations and cooperation on various projects. So just to start off, um, uh, we, you know, the, the law school um, has, I think uh, we're over 65 faculty now. Uh, 10 of those, 10 of those faculty, uh, well, 65 full-time, 10 of those are in our natural resources program, which uh, we've, we've now expanded the, the, the title of it. Um, and I have to admit, mostly because of Google, and we want people to be able to Google search us. So it's Energy, Environmental, and Natural Resource Systems Law Program. So it's a, a really long title, but we hope people will be able to find us better this way. But we have a, a, a fairly large faculty with 10 full-time uh, 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 faculty members, and then two uh, who are executive faculty and three adjunct faculty. Um, and with, with that size of, of uh, a program, we're uh, relatively one of the larger natural resources, environmental law, energy law programs in the country. Uh, we regularly have collaborative programs with uh, uh, AgriLife, Bush Engineering Health, uh, TWRI, which is a Texas Water Resources Institute, and then uh, WMHS, Water Management and Hydrological Sciences Program, and of course the Energy Institute. Um, we, between our, our 15 faculty, we cover, we'd like to say, you know, just about everything under the sun, uh, because we do cover all the energy issues, environmental issues, animal um, food, land use, uh, all sorts of things um, at the law school in terms of the courses and in terms of the research that we do. Um, we also have a really, uh, I think what's unique amongst law schools is this capstone course, and I'll tell you more about that uh, towards the end. Um, and then some other, other programs that we have, um, overseas uh, trips in particular, uh, where these are not study abroad programs, they're actually courses where we take students, uh, our students only on these, um, and this is actually one of the areas we're looking to maybe collaborate with other departments to make them interdisciplinary uh, field classes. Um, and uh, I am tentatively, I will be taking another group to Israel in May of 2021 on an energy and environment, energy and water law and dispute resolution program. Uh, and this will be, uh, we're now developing it. Uh, I did this uh, two years ago and it was really wonderfully successful. So um, this is just a big bit of background on our program. What I really want to focus on is, is our faculty and the diversity of, of the topics and subject areas that, that uh, we cover. And I can't talk about everybody in our program. So I'm going to, I'm going to highlight um, six particular faculty members who I think are, are doing really um, you know, fascinating work uh, and also interdisciplinary work where there's, there's opportunities, particular, particular opportunities for uh, other units, other departments at a and to, to look to these folks to uh, uh, explore uh, collaborative uh, opportunities. Uh, so Felix Mormon, um, uh, those of you with the Energy Institute are probably know these two guys, Felix Mormon and, and Guillermo Garcia, uh, fairly well. They're both you know, squarely in the energy sector. Uh, Felix is much more or oriented towards uh, clean tech, uh, alternative energy uh, resources. Guillermo is much more focused on uh, uh, international oil and gas is issues. Uh, so not necessarily, you know, domestic, what happens here in, in, the, in our, you know, the Permian Basin or the Eagle Fork Shale, but really 
what happens in a, in a cross-border situation like the Gulf of Mexico or on uh, the international markets. Uh, and Guillermo also is, is, uh, uh, has particular expertise in, in these business issues that are trans, uh, inter international transboundary and focusing especially on, on the energy sector. So let me start with, a little bit with, um, with Felix on some of his uh, research projects uh, that he's been focusing on. Just again, to give you a flavor of, of the different topics that, that we're addressing uh, at the law school. Uh, one of these is this policy trends for clean energy in the U.S. and U.S. And he was looking, um, I guess you'd call it a, a top level uh, comparison of energy policies and laws in, in these two uh, uh, jurisdictions. Um, and trying to figure out, you know, how does the regulatory, the legal system um, relate to the sector, especially in terms of the priorities that the, the, that the uh, that the, um, at the at that high level, at the EU level, and at the federal government level in the U.S., you know what are the energy priorities? What are they trying to do? And uh, so he published recently an article on this, and it, you know, I, I to me it's kind of surprising the, the the outcome that he found that you know whereas you know in the U.S. we we tout capitalism, uh, we have a really strong preference for subsidies. Um, as compared to, to other jurisdictions. Um, and so that was one, one finding I, I found that was kind of uh, interesting. And the other one is that, um, so, sort of counterintuitive, that in Europe, they have a very strong, uh, I guess, direction. They're, they're aiming towards this um, alternative energy or clean energy, uh, these trends in, the, in that direction. And they are trying to promote competition uh, with, towards that goal. In the U.S., the goal is the free market. So whether we go towards clean energy or alternative energy, it's up to the market to decide. And it's a diff different ways of using the market, uh, um, be it based on the different objectives. So uh, th this is one of the projects that uh, Felix is working on. Uh, and like I said, he's, a, he's already put out at least one article uh, on, on this topic. Um, another one that I, I wanted to highlight is this automated uh, regulation. And when I say automated, he, he wants to take it to the le next level of, of artificial intelligence. Uh, but he argues that uh, although we haven't had artificial intelligence, uh, you know, uh, until more, you know, last uh, uh, decade or two, uh, we've been doing automated regulation for decades. Um, and some of the examples he gives are, you know, public utility regulators using fuel adjustment clauses to automatically adapt a utility's approved rates to change in the, uh, in the cost of, of, of its fuel inputs and avoiding the need for costly and time consuming regulatory proceedings. So you don't have to go back to the regulators to adjust uh, the regulations because the prices have changed. Uh, another example are, are uh, all these uh, fuel efficiency technology requirements and some other requirements you've, also, you've heard of like, uh, you know, uh, in the statute you see best available technology. And as the technology changes, well, the regulation itself doesn't necessarily change, but it does automatically adjust to uh, changes in the market and in the sector. So uh, he argues that we've already had these um, automations in place, but now he says, what happens if we take this to this next level of artificial intelligence? And um, he's, um, you know, I, I, he seems pretty positive about it, very careful, hesitant, but uh, in terms of, um, you know, everybody fears the, uh, you know, the AI will take over the world and, and will be redundant and uh, what will happen to, to you know, to, to people. But uh, he thinks that uh, he's much more positive and thinks that AI could be a significant uh, upgrade to the mechanisms that we've already implemented. And he's, and I should say, he is particularly looking at uh, ener the energy sector uh, when he's doing this um, as he's doing this research. I have this other one on here, uh, solar energy development on public lands. Um, I, I don't have much information on, on that particular project he was working on um, this past year, so I don't know the, the status of it. But the, the general idea is that you know, public lands, those are federally owned, uh, generally they're federally owned. A few, there's a few that are state owned uh, in, some, in some states, but usually we're talking about state pub, or federal public lands. And the question is, well, can you cite solar energy development there? who, you know, who, who um, collects the, 
the, the costs or the fees, if there's a rental fee, if there's a, uh, a fee for use of the land, uh, you know, does it go to the federal treasury? What kind of regulations can you impose on them? Um, but that, that's the, my, uh, I, I don't have more details on that particular uh, project. Um, Guillermo, as I said, he's much more focused on uh, um, oil and gas issues in an international transboundary context. And one of his uh, recent projects, uh, he, he just uh, received a grant from the uh, SMU Texas Mexico Center. He's working with uh, Professor James Coleman, who's at uh, SMU uh, at the School of Law. And they're looking at uh, how these regulatory uncertainties are now you know, cropping up in this, you know, the, the, what is, whatever we're calling this NAFTA 2.0 or NAFTA 3.0 um, relationship that we're having with Mexico and Canada. And how is that affecting energy inter integration? Um, as many of you know, uh, we've got pipelines uh, crossing over between US Mexico, US Canada, uh, uh, transporting you know, the, either the, the raw products, raw material, uh, uh, raw oil uh, and, and the oils uh, uh, and so on, uh, but also the finished products we, you know, we ship by pipeline uh, finished gas uh, to Mexico. Um, and so we're integrated, we're, we're, we're connected. Uh, all of North America is connected in various ways. And the question is, well, what, how does this UM, USMCA affecting that integration? Is it accelerating? Is it uh, slowing it down? Is it, um, uh, you know, well, what are the impacts? And that's, he, that's what he's working on right now. So there's, it's, they're very early uh, in their um, research. They have, they plan to organize, a, a, he's told me, up to three workshops, and they're going to be doing uh, interviews with all sorts of regulators, practitioners, and industry leaders uh, uh, as they pursue this, uh, this project. Um, the uh, China Petro Dragon, that one, uh, to me, I, I'm interested in international law and politics always, uh, and so this one particularly fascinates me because um, uh, this is looking at the uh, basically state-owned um, uh, oil and gas sector from China as it's making its moves around the world. And you know maybe some of these companies do, do seem to be independent, uh, but obviously the Chinese government does have some control even on, on, on some of their so-called independent companies. Uh, but these companies are investing all over the world and uniquely, they're investing in a cross-border situation. So, for example, in the, in the Gulf of Mexico, not only are these Chinese companies investing in some of these you know, uh, um, offshore oil uh, development projects, but they're buying rights right at the border, which is you know, on the U.S. side or on the Mexican side. And in fact, they've been doing, doing more purchases on the Mexican side. And the question is, well, can they unitize across the border then? Uh, can they pump on one side, even though there's this international political boundary? And um, Guillermo is, is suggesting that uh, China is doing it deliberately uh, as a learning tool uh, because they want to expand their global reach uh, in the energy sector and what they're doing in the Gulf of Mexico and a few other places, they're, they're, they're testing the water, so to speak. Uh, he thinks their, their big long-term objective is actually the South China Sea uh, and what's gonna happen there and trying to figure out what is the law applicable to these transboundary uh, um, natural resources, oil and gas deposits uh, offshore. And if you pump on one side and you have an international political boundary in the middle of the ocean, I mean, who has rights? And when you invest on one side, can you, can you pump from the other side? Or can you, do you have to invest on both sides and so on? So uh, that, that's, that's, uh, uh, that's, he's published one article on that topic and uh, I believe he's still looking at it uh, and, and trying to expand it and, and do some more work uh, from a political science, uh, uh, really political science uh, analysis and then adding how the law, uh, the international law applies to it. Uh, the third topic here he's looking at is these uh, pipelines crossing indigenous lands. And he's looking at it in the, I should say, Pan America. Um, he's got examples uh, from the US, from Mexico, from the Amazon. I um, uh, can't remember the specific ones, but um, uh, 
uh, looking at the idea that you know these companies invest in, with these pipelines to to extract and deliver the oil and gas, uh, and many times these pipelines cross indigenous lands. Uh, so these companies have domestic and international legal rights because of their contracts, their investments, uh, and they're protected under various legal regimes, domestic and international. But these indigenous peoples, they also have different protections under domestic and international law, and in effect, they clash. Um, and as you might imagine, typically, I shouldn't say typically, but very often, um, the indigenous communities um, are, are, get trampled on. And he's looking to see what can international law do uh, uh, and international policy do to manage this, these disputes. Is there a way to balance these types of competing interests or is it going to be a zero sum game? Um, and what are the opportunities um, um, for these kinds of conflicts which are occurring? We've heard about the Keystone Pipeline here in the US, uh, but they're really occurring uh, uh, throughout the world, and he's particularly looking at uh, in the Americas. Uh, so that, those are two uh, of our researchers. Uh, let me go into uh, Vanessa. I'll talk a little bit about myself in terms of my research. Uh, I put both of us on the same page here because uh, both of us uh, have a particular penchant for, for water issues, uh, although Vanessa hasn't done, um, hasn't uh, researched on water in the, in the recently. She's done so in the past. Um, her, her areas are as I said, water, water law, water policy, but even more broadly, natural resources. And she looks at it from, especially from a property rights point of view and an economics point of view. And so one of the projects that she's working on right now um, is this, um, uh, what she's calling, and this is, this is something new to me that I hadn't thought about, um, transferring legal doctrine or, or borrowing legal doctrine. The idea that you uh, you know, one jurisdiction you know, applies a law in a certain way, and maybe our jurisdiction wants to borrow that or just transfer it. So, oh, you know, those folks over there apply a certain concept or doctrine or process to water or oil and gas or wind. Uh, we can apply it the same way. Why not? Um, that, that's what we're calling transfer, you know, transferring of law or transferring of legal doctrine. But she takes it one step further because it's not just between uh, legal regimes. It's not just between, for example, the civil law countries of, of Europe and Latin America and so on versus the common law countries of the US, uh, um, England, um, uh, Australia, and so on. Um, it's also within jurisdictions, so between US states, okay, between common law states. But now the re what I think is really interesting is it's between fields. So taking doctrines from the oil and gas field and take applying it to water. Um, we, we live in Texas, you probably have heard about the day case and the rule of capture. And the day case was in 20, a decision of the Texas Supreme Court in 2012, where they applied oil and gas law to groundwater. Um, and the question here is, is this a uh, appropriate transfer. There's no question that legally they can do it, but this is really inappropriate. Why did they do it? Is there some kind of transaction cost issue? Is there some kind of uh, property rights regime that's, that's relevant in oil and gas? It's equally relevant in water law. Um, um, and so she, she is, is looking at those kinds of issues in this, in this project and trying to uh, better understand why we transfer le legal doctrines from one particular field to another, and she's focusing here on, on water, water, oil, and gas, and wind energy, uh, which, you know, how do you apply property rights to oil and gas versus wind versus water? These are, these are very different, uh, uh, very difficult concepts and ideas, uh, but uh, really fascinating kind, kind, of, kind of research. Um, the other topic here that she's, she's also working on right now, and this is, I, I think, a somewhat early stage, um, uh, she's uh, looking at how we manage um, transportation and climate change at the local, regional, state, national level. And she's arguing in terms of, well, what is their goal? If the goal is to reduce emissions, 
it might be better to regulate transportation in particular at a re regional level. Right now, you know, at Fort Worth or, or maybe College Station, you have a, a bus system, but that's on the municipal level. Um, do we have anything on the regional level? Does, is it regulated on a regional or a state level? Um, the, the short answer is no. But what if we did it on a regional level with the idea of emphasizing urbanism, um, constraining where we do have, where we do permit transportation, public transportation versus private, you know, uh, you know, 10 lane highways or so on. And if our goal is to re reduce emissions, maybe the regulation of transportation should be done at this broader level and not uh, on, a, on a municipality or, or, or local level. Uh, this, this research is, is still an early stage and is, being, is developing and, and uh, we hope to, to hear more about it. Um, my own research, um, so I focus primarily on, on water issues. I, I do a lot of integration of law and science um, where I, I look at the, the scientific underpinning of, of, of whatever the subject matter that I'm looking at and looking to see if the law is is uh, appropriate if it's uh, justified even. Um, you know, for example, you look at the rule of capture and it was justified originally because it was so secret and occult and unknowing and un you know, we, don't, we didn't know how it flowed. That's not the case today. And yet we still apply the rule of capture here in Texas. And so the question is, is it scientifically relevant? Uh, is it, is it uh, appropriate? Does it, uh, is it logical? Um, could we transfer to something else? So that's, that's a lot of my, my work. Um, and I do this at the local, regional, national, and international level levels. And um, one of the projects I'm looking at right now is um, how international water law, the law that applies as between countries, relates to climate change uh, and water security. And trying to figure out, well, what is our objectives with climate change and water security? And how does that international legal regime that's in place does it help it? Does it hurt it? Um, you know, in international law, we really focus on sovereignty. That's the big, big notion, which is really a, a, a complicated way of saying ownership, property. The country owns this territory. Um, well, recognizing other countries' sovereignty, there's a lot of you know, international legal and political issues here. How does that relate to climate change? can we actually have a basin-wide approach when all these countries claim sovereignty? So that's one of, that's one of the projects I'm looking at right now. Um, I'm also looking at uh, th this topic of new water, uh, uh, part of the X grant, uh, where we have uh, researchers at, uh, in geosciences, T Texas Water Resources Institute, um, engineering, um, I think Bush School, uh, maybe one more I'm missing, um, and we're looking at, you know, under what circumstances does desalination uh, and or wastewater recycling and reuse, uh, does it serve a community, particularly urban communities? And when is it a good thing? When is it, you know, uh, what, how can we maximize that uh, effort? And of course, I'm looking at sort of the legal regulatory structure to see under what conditions are the laws and regulations and the permit requirements and compliance points, do they help or hinder do they promote, discourage? Does it matter what legal regime you have, and so on? Um, that's ongoing. Um, uh, I'll tell you about a project in a minute that my students did on this. Um, and the other two, I, I'll just mention briefly. I've been working on Mexico US transboundary groundwater resources with uh, uh, folks at the Texas Water Resources Institute um, for six, seven years. And, Everything from mapping, uh, you know, finding hydrological units, identifying what is a transboundary aquifer, how would we define it, and then locating the, them on the U.S.-Mexico border, and eventually we hope to get to the governance level, which is you know what I'm, I'm particularly interested in is you know how do we manage them and regulate them and allocate them and so on, and then this other monster project that I'm working on, uh, looking at the groundwater law in the U.S. We're doing a state-by-state -state survey. Um, uh, very detailed survey. Uh, we've been doing this for a couple of years. Uh, we just published uh, 13 states uh, a few months ago. We're, we should get another 15 states by the end of this year. I'm hoping the, the rest of them will be done within the next year or two. 
Eventually, we're going to try to put this into a database and we can hopefully do cross-state comparisons. So for example, what are the permitting requirements for putting a well or for uh, uh, withdrawals or uh, how do states do uh, uh, recognize climate change impacts on groundwater resources? And I want to be able to do a cross-state analysis, uh, analysis on all these different questions that we have. Uh, but now we're just gathering the data and, and building this information and, and eventually putting this into a, uh, a database. Um, so if anybody has suggestions, I, this last part, I don't understand what I just said. I don't know how to put this textual stuff into a database, and that's something I'm very much going to be looking for folks uh, on main campus to, to help me with that, with that, because I know it can be done. I'm not sure how to, how to code it and, and do all that kind of stuff, but that's, that's, uh, I'm still at least a year away from that. Um, two more researchers I just want to highlight briefly. Uh, Thomas Mitchell, um, a, uh, he is focused on property issues and land use, and his particular uh, research interest has focused on minority-owned owned, uh, lands. For the last four or five years, he's been working with the, um, what's called the Uniform Law Commission, which is um, um, one of these national commissions, very prestigious to, to, to get involved with, and they produce model laws for areas that are where we don't have legal uh, regimes or, or you know, there's no laws that really cover it because people just haven't realized you know, how you might address the problem. And here the problem is that um, you get uh, um, families, especially African-American uh, families, but also uh, uh, others who own land as, you know, individually and then they have kids and then they never have a will. And under the laws of transfer and testacy, the kids inherit. And then they have kids and they don't have a will. And the, the next kid, all of a sudden you have 40, 50, 100, 250 people owning the same piece of land. And under our laws in the US, if one of those people decides to sell, um, he can force everybody to either buy him or her out or put that whole property on the market so they can get their, their, the economic value of their portion. Many of these African-American families can't afford to buy out even a small percentage uh, shareholder. And what typically happens is some developer finds the right person in that family who's willing to, to sell their rights. They become, in effect, a family member. That developer becomes a family member and then says, hey, guys, uh, I want to uh, sell my rights and he can force this public sale because they can't afford to buy him out. And then it's sold at an auction. And as you know, at an auction, it's sold at a discount and he has his buddy buying the property. And then they buy the, in effect, buy the whole thing at a discount and all these uh, family members lose out. And this has happened thousands of times and especially to African-American uh, families. And so he's come up with a model rule and it's become the most successful model rule for this uh, Uniform Law Commission ever. Uh, they've, they've convinced over a dozen states now to adopt it, uh, including Texas, and it's, it's a way to protect uh, property held within families. Um, and then some of his other, uh, other research here is, is it says um, barriers to property ownerships by African-American uh, people, communities, and so on. Um, so he's very um, focused on, on that topic. And then Tim Mulvaney, who also serves uh, as our uh, associate dean for faculty development, uh, he is focused really on issues of eminent domain and regulatory takings. So how you own property and how the state can come in and either take it or regulate it from you. Um, and you know, they, can, they can definitely regulate uh, your property. The question is, if they over-regulate it, is that a, what's called a regulatory takings? Um, and that's where they regulate it to such an extent where you can't really do anything with your own property. Um, and he's, he's become one of the national experts on this particular topic. Uh, and it, so this involves things like land use and uh, land use regulations, uh, public lands, uh, even private, the whole held lands that are then regulated by, by either local municipality, state government, or federal government. 
um, and he continues to do this kind of research and uh, um, uh, very, very focused on that topic. Um, so those are the six faculty I just wanted to highlight to you all. Um, one other thing I wanted to, to highlight, I mentioned that we have this capstone program for our students. Um, and the idea is to um, give the, 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 caps, the, the students an opportunity to work with a real client. And I understand this is you know, pretty common in other departments. I will tell you this is pretty unique in law schools. We do have legal clinics where the, the students work as quasi attorneys under attorney supervision and they will go to court, they will go to, uh, they'll, they'll do uh, documents, transactional work and so on. This one's a little bit different because this is much more law policy oriented. Um, and so um, we find a client to work with and uh, we find out what exactly that, that the, the legal and policy issues of that client. And then the students do the rest of the work. They do all the research, they may interview, they, do, they work with, uh, speak with experts and they produce a public report addressing these legal issues and sometimes from a policy perspective. So we started the first one with, uh, in 2018 with uh, uh, liability for operators of, of dams and reservoirs. And we were looking particularly at these, what they call flow through uh, uh, reservoirs. Um, and uh, their report was sent to the state legislature. And soon after there were some, uh, you may remember the legislature in 2019 took on uh, a lot of uh, flooding issues uh, under advisement. And uh, we were happy that our report was part of the things that we're looking at uh, and, and looking at liability issues too. Um, last year, we looked uh, at a different type of issue and that's how municipalities along the Texas coast uh, can, what legal tools could they use to uh, help protect their community from rising sea levels, storm surges and, and uh, landslide uh, flooding. Um, so that was last year. And then this year, I mentioned the, uh, uh, my interest in uh, desalination and wastewater reuse. Uh, my students work on uh, looking at Texas and trying to identify all the legal um, compliance points, permits, uh, all the criteria that are required to uh, basically set up a facility uh, for desalination or for wastewater recycling. And because this, is, you know, this kind of guide had not been put together uh, and we presented this to the uh, Texas Water Foundation, which was our client. And they're putting, this should be up on their website shortly. This is going on the Texas Desalination Association website shortly. And it's been sent to the Texas legislature um, and TCEQ, Texas Water Development Board and, so, and some others. Uh, so we're, we're getting a lot of interest in, in this kind of work. Um, and I should note that this, type of capstone is, has great opportunity for collaboration. Um, there was actually a parallel capstone at the Bush School. While we were doing ours, they were looking at the exact same topics, but it, from the financing point, point of view. And they produced their own, uh, uh, what I, I'd say, companion report, companion to our reports here. Um, and uh, that also went to the Texas Water Foundation and so on. Um, I should probably stop here. That's, that's a, a pretty good overview of the different projects that we do and uh, activities that we get involved in. Um, and, uh, you know, we're very open and very interested in uh, interdisciplinary uh, projects and collaboration, working with other units. Um, uh, I've published with a number of scholars uh, in different units. Some of my colleagues have also, and we're very interested in these opportunities and, and possibilities. So hopefully this gives you a little bit of an in, of insight in what we do here at, at the law school, at least within our, uh, envir our energy, environmental, and natural resource systems law program. So.